Hello and good evening and welcome to the second edition of Montague Island Books. And for anyone who's joining us for the first time, this is Montague Island is a fictional island off the coast of Cumbria. And it appeared in The Curator, a book by Mike Craven, M.W. Craven, who is also one of our bookend members. And we ask um, authors to come along and visit us and bring one of the uh, friends or one of the readers with us. And they pick seven books each, uh, a music CD and a film DVD, because there is limited electric on the island for one hour per day, uh, a favourite food or meal and a luxury item. And they also get to take with them paperback copies of all the Tilly and Poe series printed so far uh, to keep them to keep them busy. Now our guest uh, tonight is um, very well known within uh, within our little group and a great author. He's a not he's northern born and bred and he has a has had a random mix of jobs to date, including bookseller, uh, pizza deliverer, karate instructor, and football coach. He originally intended to join the legal profession, but after getting his degree, ended up the job in telecoms. And he wrote this because I got this off his website, so I'm I'm hoping it's right. And writing was something he hadn't done much of since he left school until around seven years ago when he had an idea for a book uh, popped up and he found it too interesting to ignore. And his lead character, Jake Porter, and his partner, Nick Stiles. And for the same path that I've done, he's, um, he's midway through his own work in progress and um, will no doubt be slinging that out to agents once that's done and dusted. Great. So, uh, good evening, Mick, and uh, interesting Hello. to hear about you uh, becoming um, an author as well. So, do you want to uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that, or what you can? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, um, I had an idea for a book, like I say, a while ago, and I've kind of got that on the shelf. And a couple of years ago, I had a, a new idea because I kind of, I think, with the original one, I chopped and changed it and went back and, and changed it so much I kind of lost my way. Um, and I stopped enjoying it. So I came up with this new idea and basically my um, peers around a lady called Rachel Scott, who on her way home from a night out with friends is the victim or apparent victim of a serial murderer who's raping his victims before killing him. Somehow Rachel survives um, and detectives Rob Colton and Kate Ashbeck are on the case and quickly apprehend said murderer. Um, however, there seems to be a reign of terror um, on Rachel and things keep happening with clues linking back to the rape. So it's a question of have the police got the wrong person or mm. was he working as part of a group? Who knows? Great. That sounds interesting. And when do you think that will be uh, be finished? When will you get those two great words the end? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I set myself a target of having it completed by the time, although Phil Stiles will go ahead now, but by the time the Newcastle Noir Festival comes around, which is the bank holiday weekend in May, I'd like to have it written, polished and, and good to go by then. Great. So. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. That's great news. And uh, Rob, do you want to tell us a bit more? I know I, I gave a little bit of an introduction there, but do you want to tell us a bit more about your books and where people can find you on social media, etc.? Yeah, definitely. So um, I, as of Thursday last week, I've got four books currently out, all part of the same series. Um, you mentioned the, the, the main protagonists, Detective Jake Porter and Nick Stiles. So it's, it's a modern day police procedural. Um, set down in London. That's the main reason for that. Even though I'm in the North East, that's where I was pretty much working full time when I wrote them. Mm -hmm. um, it was only when I, when I came up with the characters anyway. Um, and um, yeah, so I've, I've slung them in a variety of, of nasty situations over the last four years. Um, the, the first one starts off with a, a 30 year old crime scene that's lain undiscovered for, for decades. And um, Porter and Styles stumble up, uh, upon this and uh, there's a, a, a hand in a freezer. Um, they're looking for the lady who owns the flat. She can't be found. Not only can she not be found, she's never been seen for around about 30 years. But what they can't figure out is why no one's ever reported her missing. And that includes mm -hmm. our own parents um, wow. and our own friends and family. So they need to, to work out um, whether or not she slipped away through the cracks to, to get away from someone or something or whether she was given a bit of a shove. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then I, I won't take you through all four of them, but that's a, that, that's a debut there. And then the most recent end of the line came out last Thursday. Um, and that um, 
kicks off with the um, the murder, rather um, prominent murder of uh, a popular vlogger, um, live streamed on one of his broadcasts, wow. and it's kind of set against the backdrop of um, Brexit, the rise of the far right, and the effect that that kind of climate can have on people and, and what it brings out in them. Um, and, and also, you've got a sprinkling of, of Jake Porter's personal life in the background as well. He's kind of struggled with the loss of his wife. Um, she was killed in a hit and run about three years prior. Um, and all of those memories kind of start welling up when mm-hmm. something happens in that case, again, to, to kind of bring that all fresh back for him. So that one that one came out on Thursday. Um, all available on um, on the usual platforms, Amazon, Waterstones, um, you know, I'd like to encourage people to use Hive, which will put you in touch with your regular independent bookstore as well. We've got some great ones up here, like Forum Books and Corbridge. Um, and then on social media, you can find me on Facebook and on Twitter, um, both as um, under my full full right name of Robert Scrag, <laughs> even though it's Rob on the screen today. Um, and my website, robertscrag.com, which I will update the seven years <laughs> after we've done this. <laughs> keep you on your toes but that's yeah. that's great and, and the series is the series of books going to continue or will you start a new series so it, it, i'm at an interesting point actually um i swapped a couple of emails with my publisher um probably this was probably about four or five weeks ago now and we were talking about actually this was pre-christmas and we were talking about what might come next and we, we kind of we both have the same opinion thankfully which is Actually, I'd like to I'd like to put it on pause for a little bit and try something else. Mm-hmm. And equally, they said actually where it finishes, that's a great point just to take mm-hmm. a breather, and and would love to see what other ideas you've got. So I'm busy polishing up a few of those and and just pulling a few synopses together. Great. Um, and and I'll be sharing those with my editor quite soon and see if they like that. But the, the series is definitely something I do want to go back to at some point. Yeah. Um, I've got at least two more books kind of mapped out in my head already. Nice. Um, and as, as long as I've got ideas that, that make sense and that don't feel like I'm forcing them for the mm-hmm. sake of continuation, I'm, I'm happy to keep going. Whether, yeah. whether I'll ever reach kind of Lee Child, Michael Connolly status in terms of numbers uh, of, of books. Time will tell. Matter, but, yeah. um, I, w- I would be happy with six, maybe seven in the series. But if the appetite's there for more, I'd, I'd love to write more. So the new ones that you're going to be looking at next, are they crime as well? Same genre? Uh, most of them are. I've actually written uh, a kid's picture book as well, which I'm, I'm hoping to find a home for this year. But the others are all crime, um, different kind of crime, though. So I, I want to take a step away from police procedural. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've written, um, uh, I've got plotted out one that's more of a kind of a domestic noir type of thing. So it's more about the family um, that a crime um, happens within and the effect on the family and what yeah. that kind of does to that dynamic. Right. Um, and then the most recent one that I'm busy working on at the moment is more of a, um, it's more of an action thriller. But then there's, there's, you know, the police are there in the background, but mm-hmm. it's more about the, the people that it's happening to. Yeah. Um, and the police are kind of, I, I drag them in when they're needed, but actually it's more about, I, I think it's, it feels e- even more appealing to me for, for it not to be police because they're trained to react in certain ways in certain situations. Whereas if you take more everyday people, they're more likely to, whether it be to panic or make rash decisions or, or different decisions and more emotional decisions so you can you can have a lot more fun with that i think yeah great that's wonderful now we've also got a couple of bouquin members with us today we've got lm crea or totty as she's called on the on the screen um and she will be appearing on the show in a couple of weeks time and we've Keep also me. what was that sorry Keep reminding me. I oh, will keep you reminding you. And we've also got Claire, one of our other members, uh, one of our reader members who's joined us as well. Hello, Claire. She's might she muted herself. So, <laughs> and um, if you've got any questions along the way to fire at the guys, feel free to uh, to jump in and uh, and interrupt. But we will start now. So, um, as I say, going on this remote island in Cumbria, um, you've got a number of items that can you can take with you. The first one uh, is seven books. Uh, so like seven of your favorite books. Um, so Rob, would you like to tell us your first one and a little bit about it, first of all? Yeah, so this is in no particular order, but it's it's books that have had an impact on me when I've read them um, and, and ones that have kind of stayed with me. Some are more recent than others. Um, so no, in no particular order, the first one that I'm, I'm going to go for is The Firm by John Grisham. Mm. Um, it was the first, first of his books that I read. First time I read it, I think I was probably about fifth, 
16, maybe 15, 16. Um, and at that point, obviously, it hadn't been to uni yet. And I, it was one of the things that made me want to study law. I already had a kind of a, a notion in my head that, that that would be a direction I'd want to do. Um, you'd think after reading the film, that might put me off, actually, with some of the stuff that happens in there. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <laughs> It, it really it's it's one of those books where I, I found myself going back to on a number of kids I think I've read it like four or five times over the years not for a while now but it's just a great example of of what a real kind of taut pacey thriller can yeah. be I think for me um and again it's you know central character is someone who um he's he's still quite young and fresh not a huge amount of life experience mm. and he's really thrown in at the deep end into yeah. a scenario that you know I, I wouldn't know how to deal with um <laughs> So yeah, he's he's put in some really you know nasty awkward situations, um, and such a great premise as well for me. For those for those who haven't read it, I don't know how much I want to say in case there's the spoilers. I know it's a fairly <laughs> well known book, yeah. but also a great example for me of where the book absolutely remains better than the film. Yeah, because they changed big chunks for the film and completely changed the end. And 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 when I sat there and watched the film, I was like, no, why have you done that? <laughs> um, and I and I had to go back and reread it just to kind of remind myself how good it was great yeah that's a good one i, I like that boot myself so it's uh it's been as you say it's been issued quite some time now but it's one that uh stands the test of time shall we say um, yeah i think it was the, the point in time in my life that i read it as well kind of gearing up towards this is what i might want to do i didn't go into the legal profession in the end but yeah <laughs> and mick what's your first book so again in, in no particular order i've gone with um die trying by lee child so it was my first experience of Jack Reacher um, and out of the whole series, I think it's arguably still my favourite book. Um, I really, really loved it. Lee Child has this knack of making writing look very, very easy, which everyone on here will know it's actually not. Um, but it was just absolutely fantastic. I remember one particular scene, which I won't go into for spoiler's sake, but I read it and I had to put the book down and I was physically sweating. Just really, really put me right in the scene, captured everything perfectly. So, yeah. And which, which book is it? Is that the early in the series? Or... Yeah, so Die Trying was number two. Number it was the two. first one I read. And then I went back to Killing Floor, which was number one. When I read that, there was only four Reacher books out, actually, at the uh, time. Yeah, so and now he's uh, yeah. churning them out. <laughs> yeah, churning them out. <laughs> That's great. Good choice. And um, Rob, what's your second book? It's a far more recent one, actually. Um, and it's one that I only read last year. So book number two for me is The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Um, and the reason I picked that, it was just, it was, it was one of my top, probably my top two books for last year, um, top two or three. And it just, it was so different from anything I'd read for a while. You know, I, and the, the, the pitch that I'd been given beforehand, it was like um, Agatha Christie, Christie meets Quantum Leap, mm. which was enough to intrigue me and think, what the hell is this going to be about? Um, and I think from the, from the point of view of a reader, it, I was I was really really kind of you know thrown headfirst into the world that Stu Turner created. But mm. as an author as well, it, it was one that really made me kind of stand back and admire the the amount of craft that had gone into making that. Mm. Because you know I, I know some people use kind of cork boards and stuff to pull it out, mm. and I just I'd love to see what his <laughs> cork board looked like with that because that was oh. just you know to to. And when I say to keep track, I don't want to put people off thinking it's too complicated because it, it genuinely isn't. But it's just it constantly, constantly Complex. has you thinking. There is no, there's no, as a reader, no time to kind of sit and breathe mm -hmm. and, and, and relax because there's no let up mm -hmm. all the way through. Um, and and the, the ending as well really kind of sewed it up nicely. I didn't have a clue what was happening. Love at the end. I'm, I'm normally, normally good at guessing, but I was way, way off. Um, absolutely brilliant book as well. Yeah. Great, that sounds that sounds good and a good one to take on the island. And Mick, what's your next one? So number two for me is The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by Steve Larson. Um, that is just such an amazing series. And I find Lisbeth Salander one of the most compelling characters I've ever come across. I just love everything about it. It's so gritty and real. Um, yeah, I just... Love it. I know that uh, David Lagerkrantz had tried and wrote a few afterwards, which are which are pretty good still, but they don't quite capture that magic that Stieg seemed to have. Um, and I've even bought the, the feature-length DVDs on the back of that, which I think <laughs> are a good representation, but they're seven hours long. Um, wow. They've got all sorts of extra scenes, but yeah, they really capture everything brilliantly as well. So yeah, that was my number two. 
Great, and I'm sure lots of people will be adding uh, adding with a nice mixture. Of us. I'm sure lots of people will be uh, will be adding them to the TBR mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your third one, Rob? My third one is by uh, an American author called Greg Isles, um, and it still never ceases to amaze me how many people haven't heard of him over here. No, no. Because he's again, he's one of those authors where I don't need to read the blurb before I buy the book. I, I just know I'm going to get it. So this he's, he's written quite a number. In a, in a particular series. And this one, it's a trilogy within the series. And the book is called Natchez Burning. It's set in the town of Natchez, Mississippi. And it is, the only word I can think to describe it is epic, absolutely epic. And I know Mick's read this as well, because um, we were talking earlier on about what books we might bring on. Uh, and both of us were sat there going, yeah, there's got to be at least one Greg Isles book in there. <laughs> what, and, what genre it's, is it, Rob? It's, it's thriller. Um, oh. So it's it, the main character, Penn Cage, is a former prosecutor turned novelist, um, goes back to his hometown earlier in the series just for a short visit, sticks around, um, and he becomes mayor of the town. Um, oh. And this particular book is uh, it, it's the start of a trilogy where his, his family life is really kind of turned upside down. His dad is accused of a pretty serious crime. Um, and the, the plot stretches back into the, the 50s and the 60s. You know, right. taps into kind of the, the the culture that they had in Mississippi in the deep mm -hmm. South back then. You know, it was the um, all the, the kind of the racial tension they had. Um, you know, harkens back to the days of the KKK. Yeah. There's even links into the likes of the mob. Um, you know, JFK, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. It's got honestly, it's it is again such a sprawling epic tale. Um, and I was really torn in terms of which of the books in the trilogy to pick. Mm -hmm. So I, I've, I've gone for this one simply to try and tempt people into picking it up and reading it because it is one of the best books I've read and, and certainly one of the um, the best trilogies that I've ever read. Great. I'll definitely uh, definitely have a look out for that one. And have you picked another one from that series, Mick? Or have you kept it away? <laughs> I, um, it was one of the first books I jumped into my head and after I didn't want to bring the same ones as uh, Rob, so I, I went differently, but I have to mirror what Rob said. And Greg Isles, again, I have to agree with Rob, hardly anyone over here seems to have heard of him. Yet his books are absolutely mind-blowingly brilliant. They are really, really brilliant. It's one of those things where you guarantee a good read when you open that cover. It's the kind of so, thing you read, and I'll, I'll put them on his books and just think, like, why do I bother? Like, why do I bother <laughs> writing? I, I can't come close to that. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, great. So what's your, uh, what's your third one, Mick? So I've gone back in time a little bit to my childhood, um, a book that I... It's probably one of the first ones I can remember reading, and I must have read it about 50 times after that. And it's the C.S. Lewis masterpiece of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Great. Which is just brilliant. I just absolutely loved it. I loved getting just sucked away into that land yeah. and everything about it. And no matter how many times I read it, I still enjoyed it every time as a child. I still have a copy now. So, yeah. yeah. It's amazing how stories like that stay with you for 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 years isn't it well for sure. a lifetime yeah. really yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah good good choice and what's uh, what's your fourth book that you'll be taking on the island rob well i'm gonna mix it up with a bit of non-fiction um mm. so it's not not only is it not crime it's non-fiction um and again it's just it's a book that really stood out in the year that i read it it's only a couple of years back and i've never laughed so much when i've been reading a book um and this is this is going to hurt by adam k right. um for those who haven't read it, Adam Kay is a he's a former um, doctor, and um, he, he spent a number of years in the NHS working working up to a relatively senior position. Um, I forget exactly how high he got, but it's it's basically excerpts from his diary, um, and it is at the same time one of the funniest yet one of the most kind of touching and poignant mm -hmm. books that I think I've ever picked up. And you literally you go from I was in tears with laughter, literally tears coming down my face when I was reading it. Um, and, um, and then within a couple of chapters, he hits you with a really kind of, you know, um, heartfelt story. And it finishes up, kind of ties it all nicely in terms of at the end about around, you know, this is why I left the NHS and this is the, the kind of the state it's in. And this is why we should all be behind it and support it and, and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it kind of finishes as a little bit of a call to arms, but the, the kind of the journey that he goes through, um, he is just articulate of that in, in such a unique way. Um, one of those ones again i would urge everyone to, to have yeah. a read of 
definitely. And it sounds a bit odd when you say, you know, it's like non-fiction, but the, and it's about sort of N NHS and what have you, but with humour in it. But I suppose when you're working in the NHS, you go through, particularly at the minute, you go through that much stress and anxiety. I imagine you've got to bring a bit of humour in to just get through, you know, get through your day kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, and there's some of the humour is a little bit dark, but that, that appeals to me. Um, and as you say, I, did, I think a lot of it is what he needed to, mm. to kind of to get him through some of the real tough yeah. shifts that he had to do and the real tough um, scenarios that he found himself in. Definitely. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. But I'll, I'll check that out. And what about you, Mick? What's your number four? So number four for me is um, it's a Holland Coburn book. It's Home from the Myron Bolitar series. Um, I just love Holland's style of writing, the dry humour he puts in. His characters are all just brilliant. He has an, a knack for making you love his characters, even the bad ones. You just you kind of feel them, you know. Um, his, his protagonist, Myron, has really been put through the mill by Harlan. He really has had some traumatic events in his life. And Home was the, the last book that I can recall that the, him and the other um, main character, Win are together. And he tied it up really nicely at the end. I kind of got the feeling he was wrapping things up. I don't know if he is, but it was just such a funny, sad, and funny and compelling read. Great. That sounds interesting. So nice to see all these uh, different genres and bits and pieces going on. So what's your fifth book, Rob? My fifth book, um, so similar to Mick, I have got one from my childhood in there. Um, I used to read a lot of a lot of fantasy when I was a kid. Um, and the, the fact that I'm picking this particular one ahead of, even ahead of Tolkien, kind of shows what, what place it has in my heart because I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy um, but I'm going to go for Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin um, again because it's if I think back to some of the first books that I can really vividly remember reading that one is, is one of the first ones that really hooked me um, I feel I'm slightly cheating because the, the version I had was a trilogy like in one book <laughs> so I'm you didn't you didn't specify what yeah, you do I'll, that, let you, I'll let you off with that if it's one book <laughs> it's, it's, I'll it's, let that, you off. it's that legal training from reading the firm I'm exploiting a loophole <laughs> yeah um but it was just such such an amazing world to be dropped into and you know in the same way that Tolkien did with them um, with Middle Earth but this one predates it for me which I think is why it, it holds a, a special place in my heart um, and it was just, you know, again, for anyone, and, and I've, I've read from quite an early age quite a lot, but for anyone who wants to, to look for kind of books that can really get kids interested and inspired by books, you, you, you know, you could do a hell of a lot worse than, than look up Ace Le Guin. Mm -hmm. And is that like um, a bit like the Lord of the Rings trilogy? Is it like um, a, a its own world? Is it kind of? It is. Yes. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, it follows one central character who's um, you, you kind of meet this this guy um, Jed from an early age, and it's it's kind of the path that he takes to discovering the, the power that he has. He's, he's a mage, um, mm -hmm. and, and how he develops that. How he he's led quite a sheltered life on this on this little island how he first discovers that actually there's some pretty dark things in the world out there um that because he then grows this power and develops it will look to target him and, and kind of to, to challenge him if you like so it's a real kind of uh, his his life story really and that's a trilogy you say yeah yes great wonderful yeah that sounds good and what about yourself mate what's your number five um i've gone with another one from from the past and it's the body by stephen king which for those who don't know that's the book that prompted the film stand by me um i remember being in um english and we had to write a story based on a story so we had to kind of change the events in there and i picked that one because i thought it's a small novella it shouldn't be too difficult and ended up absolutely loving the book i mean i know it's one where you get such value for every word on the page so yeah i just loved this and the film was fantastic too yeah i think with stephen yeah. king you always get good value don't you in a book That's it's it. like <laughs> you know yeah. it's just every page has got something going on with it and yeah i think it's most people that are coming on here will there'll be at least one of the you know one guest every week but we'll have at least one stephen king book mm -hmm. in, so uh, yeah. that's great and what's your number six rob uh get quite a recent one again for me um i read this one last year and it's probably again for me it was easily top three if not what number one or two and it's um we begin at the end by chris whittaker I'd held off reading a couple of his um, for a little while, I'd, not for, for any particular reason other than I just had a big pile. And, and I read the first one, I was Tall Oaks, 
which was enough to make me think, oh, yeah, I really enjoy that. Let's see what else he's, he's got. And this was, you know, it's, it's bad as I've a, a, been in the crime genre, but it's different to most crime books I've read. For me, it was, it was almost like literary crime. It wasn't, it wasn't out and out crime thriller. Um, and the main character in this is a, is a young girl. Um, and you, you, know, you follow her life and what's happened in her life. The, um, it, it's more about the impact of a crime again. So you know, you know what's happened. She, you know, she's suffered a loss years ago, mm-hmm. and it's about um, what happens to her because of that, and how that affects her life. And when the man who um, committed that crime gets out of prison, the effect that has when he comes back to that town, and she's still there, and and the tangents that that sends her life spiraling off on, and it's it's probably got more, I think the best way to describe it, more heart and more emotion than I think any other crime book I can think of in the last couple of years that I've read. Well, it's funny because we were talking about this last week because Chris MacDonald, um, he chose it for one of his books and he's been banging yeah. the drum for it. I couldn't get into it. <laughs> Everybody else would say, this is amazing, this is amazing. <laughs> but I just, I think I've, I've read, over the last 12 months, I've read too much British crime fiction. And mm. just the, the the language, not you know, just like the way it was written, I think. But I, it's one of those books where I'm going to go back to it again this year and try it again. Yeah. And hopefully, it'll it'll get me this time. But uh, well, that's I mean, that's a great yeah. example of how subjective the whole this whole yeah. thing is, isn't it? Because yeah. you know, there's you, you see some amazing books that have some like crazy <laughs> one star reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Speaking of which, have you got a one a funny one star review that you've had? Would well, you know what? So far, I've only had one one star review that I'm aware of, um, and it, I don't think it was even that funny. Really, it was only about six words long. It just said something like um, "overdone, nothing new, nothing different." Um, I think my my favorite my favorite review, actually, in terms of of not amazing ones, was actually a three star review. And this was for what falls between the cracks. And this was on um, on the Apple iBook store. So bear in mind, three stars for me is, you know, three stars, it's, it's a solid for me. It would <laughs> yeah. be like, I enjoyed it. It's not, it wasn't amazing, but I enjoyed it. And, and their comments for the three stars were excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> and I just thought, if that's what gets three stars, my God, I, I, you know, what, what have you got to do to get five? <laughs> That is great because it is amazing when you go through and read books that you've loved all your life and like people are saying, Oh, I couldn't even get through the first chapter. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah. best, the best ones are when it's like the, it's a one star review that says, Never even ordered this book. Yeah. It didn't turn up or the cover was damaged. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Mike Craven was telling us about one um, when he was he came on um, one of the sessions we did last year, and he, he was telling us. I don't think it was actually his, but he was telling us about a friend, and they got a five star review for the cheese that they used, <laughs> <laughs> and there was no mention of cheese in the book. <laughs> so I always have to look um, and try uh, and find funny ones. There's another Northeast author, Howard Linsky, and I remember him telling us about a review he got for a book called The Drop, and he got a five-star review for that, but the part of the review was, I thought I was buying Michael Connolly's book, The Drop, but got this one instead. <laughs> it was actually pretty good, though. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. So you got a new fan out of it. That's great. <laughs> I love, love, them, love them reviews and the way, and some people get really sort of angry and <laughs> just brilliant reading them. And what about you, Mick? What's your number seven? Six. Number six, sorry. Number six. So, yeah. Someone else. Yeah. yeah. So I've gone with um, another fantasy book, and I've gone with George R. R. Martin's masterpiece, Game of Thrones. Great. So, I mean, that, that series has something of everything in. There's something for everyone. Um, it's just fantastic. Every page leaves you on a cliffhanger, wanting to read more. Just I couldn't get enough. I absorbed it as fast as I can. Um, yeah. And it's one of my favourites. Plus, it's such a big book. I'll get some value on the island as you well. Will. <laughs> and it's one of them where you can read it three or four times and still pick up little bits. Sure, every yeah, time. Stuff you miss every time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's just a great read. So a great one to take to the island. So now we're on to our last books, number seven. So what's your last one, Rick? Rob, uh, mine's another an, another chunky one, and I'm looking back through my picks, and I think I've subconsciously gone for value for money, actually. Because Evelyn Hardcastle's about 700 pages, Natchez Burnham's about six or 700. Um, so, 
you know, with any list like this, I couldn't not have one Stephen King book on there because he's another of my favourite authors. Um, so the book I've picked is The Stand. Love it. Um, a, 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 because it's huge and I'll get good value, but yeah. B, it was the first Stephen King book I read. Um, mm. And again, just such an absolutely epic cast that he's yeah. got there. You know, the, that, that real kind of you know, messed up dystopian world that he creates and, mm. and all the... the I guess the, the, the different choices and dilemmas that all of those characters get in and, and how you see them evolving mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, you know, when I say growing, not necessarily all in a good or positive way in that real extreme set of mm-hmm. circumstances they're in. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, again, another, another one of those ones that stays with you. It's, it's maybe a little bit hard to reread a 900 page book too often. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have gone back to that one before and I dare say I will read it again before I am um, I'm, I'm kind of uh, too old and greater. <laughs> To be able to lift up the, the 900 page or, or whatever many it is. Um, yeah. yeah. Go and train Absolutely beforehand. brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> it, again, it's one of those books that you can read, and when you reread it, you pick up bits that you like miss off like off the first time and it just seems mm. to you seem to every time you read it you seem to pick up like little bits of stories that, yeah. that maybe just maybe went over over your head but yeah i agree yeah. it's a it's a br- brilliant book and as you say it'll take you some time to uh some time to read that well it popped up in conversation just last week actually because a friend of mine's watching the, the latest tv adaptation of it um, and they said that mm, it's just not as good as the book and that again made me think like oh I've, yeah i've totally got to read that book again <laughs> Yeah, I, I, we, we're in the in the bookends book club. We've got a um, we're looking for our February books, and I was going to um, and we, we said non non crime because we, we seem to have like crime books coming up every month, and there's people who aren't really interested. So I was going to do the stand, but it's something like, <laughs> I was yeah. going to pay back. I forget it was like. 13 14 15 pounds um because it's so popular um yeah. and that was just looking on amazon so i thought i can't put that in because no one will buy it <laughs> <laughs> it probably costs like that because you've got to chop down half a dozen trees just to print a copy as well <laughs> yeah probably right there. and what about yourself uh, mick what's yours uh, what's your seventh book so I've gone with uh, one that I haven't read yet, and I hope it's allowed because um, it's actually The End of the Line by Mr. Scrag. So, uh... I, um, I was a little bit lazy, and I read the, the, the three Mr. Scrag books last year, and All That Was Buried was probably one of my top reads last year. It was just just brilliant. I loved it. Um, I'm quite intrigued because the title of this seemed to suggest it was the end although Rob's kind of let on that it maybe not be now so um I just Rob's got this brilliant knack of making really gritty dark crime you know and I just really really can't get enough of that kind of stuff so I thought I'll take something with a bit of a surprise and also if we're on the island together Rob's not going to want to borrow that because uh he already knows what happens <laughs> and well i i wonder that's why i asked the question if it was any more because i thought it sounded a bit a bit final like it was the end yeah. of the uh you know total of the end of the line but mm-hmm. well, the great thing about it is it about it mick is you can get rob to read it here <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can all, yeah, you can, yeah. <laughs> who needs yeah. an audio book when you've got the uh, the author on an island <laughs> Well, that was the, the title was actually about the twelfth choice title as well that we we ran through, and I remember when my publisher wrote back and said, "Yeah, we like this one." That the first thing I thought was, "Is that your subtle way of telling me you don't want to work with me anymore?" Or, or... yeah. <laughs> so, do you generally <laughs> choose your own titles, Rob, or is it your publisher? So the only one that has never changed from the first draft is "What Falls Between the Cracks." Mm-hmm. Um, Everything since then, it's it's been one that I've suggested, but it's been about the twelfth suggestion that I've made. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's. I, I think I was probably lulled into a false sense of security by getting my first title for my first book, thinking, "Oh, that's a doddle." Um, but after that, each time they've come back with the, with the first couple of titles and said, "It's just not quite mm. the same." You know, we want that kind of bit of intrigue that we had in that first title. We want just what else have you got? What else have you got? Yeah. What else have you got? And I notice the really striking covers you've got on your books. Do you have any say in that, or do your publishers decide, or do you have somebody special who makes them for you? Again, no, no say from me whatsoever. Um, mm. It seems to vary from publisher to publisher. I've got friends who who get sent a range of options and ask their opinion. Um, whereas for mine, I tend I, I've just for all four, I've been sent the one cover and mm. sent and with a, an email saying, 
this is the, our favourite one. We hope you love it as much as we do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've, I've never actually gone back and said, no, I hate it, because I, I genuinely do like them. But it'd be, inter- <laughs> it'd be interesting to see what the conversation would have been like if I wasn't too keen. It would, but yeah, the great covers, really like them. So we'll now, so we've now got, you've now got all your seven books packed and ready to go on to the island. Um, so now you've got, as I say, there, there is a limited power on the island, on this fictional island of one hour a day. Um, so you get to take a CD of your favourite music album with you to play. So what would your choice be for that, Rob? I've gone for Queen's Greatest Hits. Oh, lovely. Because if I, if I look back at the albums that I've, I've played over the years, that's probably had more airtime collectively mm. over the last 30 years than anything else. Absolutely love them. I'd never, ever got to see them live. Mm. Um, I remember... Uh, this goes back many, many years now, but I remember seeing them um, live on TV at, at Band Aid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the most epic performances I think I've seen in terms of getting the crowd going. But yeah, just yeah. There's, there's not a single bad song on that album. No, there's a great album, great one. And you can, because there's only two of you on the island, you can play it nice and loud as well, can't you? So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not complaining about that either. Great choice. <laughs> and what about yourself, Mick? What's, what would your choice be? So I've gone with um, What's the Story Morning Glory by Oasis. Okay. So um, I absolutely love that. It's got some of my favourite songs of all time. Don't Look Back in Anger, Wonderwall, Champagne yeah. Supernova. So I love that kind of stuff. But Queen's also a fantastic choice. I've actually seen them live as well with Adam Lambert. Right. Um, Queen, which was, which was really good. Good experience. Great. So you've got two like classic albums there, so uh, you'll still mm. be entertained on the, and it, the kind, both kind of albums that you won't get sick of. You'll be you'll be playing and playing. That's it. I've got and, a, I've got a random Freddie Mercury story actually, George, just oh, on, on, on the yeah. topic because just popped in mind. So obviously I, I was too young to, to meet him, but so my brother um, was a Mad Queen fan, as was my cousin. And my, so my eldest brother David, and he he lives in New York and has done since got into eighties. And I remember him telling me once he was in a in a bar next to Freddie Mercury, wow. um, and Freddie Mercury had his drink, put his glass down, walked out, and my brother nabbed the glass that Freddie Mercury <laughs> had been drinking from and stuck it stuck it in a bag to give to my cousin so she could have a glass that Freddie had drunk out. Of. Wow, <laughs> that is a good not story. stalkerish at all. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the bar might not have been very happy at the end of the night, but <laughs> but that's great. Um, so I love that one. So ne- next, as I say, on this limited power supply, you're also allowed to take one DVD of your favourite film. So what would you uh, what would you be taking along, Rob? Well, I was thinking just before I name it as well. So we've only got an hour of power a day, so we can't even watch a full film, can <laughs> no, we? We've got, we've got to stagger it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so there might even be arguments to you know, do we watch my film back to back on two days and then watch mix? Do we start? Let's not let's not get into that now. Domestic um, strife, yeah. <laughs> I've gone for the usual suspects. Um, and again, if, if I look at films that I've, because you know, these days I don't have a load of free time. Um, mm. You know, what with writing, reading, I've got um, I've got three kids, two of which are toddlers, um, and I don't have an awful lot of time. But Usual Suspect is the kind of film that I will rewatch, mm. and it, you know, it doesn't have to be first time round. Just the, and, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers. It has mm. one of the best endings, Great. the most satisfying endings I think I've seen. Um, and the fact that even though I know how, how it ends, mm. doesn't put me off watching it again. Mm. And every time you get, you know, you, if you've seen it, you know the bit I'm talking about. Every time I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> God. Oh, yes. Um, and, and you can watch so, it in peace because you wouldn't have a kids. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and just epic performances from every single one of them. Great. Good choice. Good choice. And what about you, Mick? What would you take? Oh, I've gone with some real cheese. I've gone with their Top Gun. <laughs> great. I just Classic. love that film. Yeah, it is. It's just, it's just great. It's entertaining, and it has a fantastic soundtrack as well, which I never get sick of hearing. So, yeah, great. And you, know, it's, again, it's one of them you can watch over and over again, isn't it? It's just like exactly, you know, that's it. Great. But as you say, you'd have to watch them split over two days or whatever. So uh, decisions, decisions. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm and... sure make it work. Yeah. So next, we've got your um, either a, a favourite food or a favourite meal uh, that you can take along with you. So, what would you choose for that, Rob? I'm a, I'm a pretty simple man. A simple taste, Joe. For me, 
steak and sandwiches all day long. <laughs> um, as, as evidenced by publication day. So I, I normally, I'll always have a bacon butty on publication day morning. Um, and there's still places open for takeaways. So I ended up having bacon sandwich on the morning. Um, I had a bacon sandwich for lunch and then I had a turkey joint wrapped in bacon for, um, for dinner. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm slightly obsessed. So are you a red sauce or a brown sauce, man? It's red for bacon, brown for sausages. <laughs> I'm like seeing it. shaking heads on the screen. What's going on? <laughs> Brown sauce all the time, Robert. <laughs> this is, is going to be a bit awkward on the island, yeah. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe one of you has chosen the uh, red over brown as your luxury item. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and what about you, Mick? What's your um, what's your food that you're, you'll be taking? So I'm, a, I'm a big meat person, um, and I've gone with ribeye steak. Oh, lovely. So I think you can have steak with it, can't you? You can have a steak sandwich, although I'm not going to have bread. But <laughs> yeah, we'll have a mix of rubs. Um, steak and eggs for breakfast, steak. I just love it. You can't get enough. It's one of those things that I'll never, ever get sick of. So yeah. easy choice for me, that one. Yeah, good one. But you've got to keep, you've got to build the fire to cook it on. <laughs> Two sticks. <laughs> I'll use some of Rob's boots. Yeah. <laughs> now, just to let the viewers and listeners into something here, I got a message from Rob <laughs> about an hour before we were due to come on saying, what can we have as a luxury item? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very intrigued to see what you've chosen. So go on, Rob. What is your luxury item? Well, you know, be before I message you, I was thinking like I'd love to take my MacBook because I can I can keep writing on that. Um, but then I thought like an, an electrical item is a little bit obvious, so I'll, I'll I'll not bother with that. And then I thought I could take me wife, take my wife, but then she says she's more of a necessity than a luxury. So. Um, <laughs> And then when you were telling us we get Mike Craven's books, I was going to take Mike so he could read the books out to us. <laughs> but in the end, I've settled on, um, as, as evidenced by the, the drink, the single malt, I'm going to go for a cask of single malt rather than a bottle. <laughs> it'll obviously last longer. Yeah. Um, and then it, I might share a bit with Mick. It depends if he insists on the whole brown sauce on bacon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, which, we'll have which whiskey would you take? Is there a special one? Um, well, so the one I'm thinking now is, is a pretty strong candidate, to be honest. I've never tried it before, but um, Mick got me this for, um, for a publication day present. <laughs> um, and uh, I, keep on getting, I keep on getting the name wrong, Mick. Is it, is it Scarla Scarpa. or Scarpa? Scarpa. Yeah. Scarpa. Um, is that, is that, how do you spell that? S-C-A-P-A. Ah, right. Great. So I think it would be a toss-up either between this or I bought myself one as a, as a publication present for my debut called Middleton Very Rare which yeah. is very, very nice as well. It seems to be a thing with book lovers and book authors is, is, is malt whiskies because I know there's a few in the group um, that are the same, they're into the malt whiskies, so uh, in the bookends group, because whenever they come on, they've always got a malt with them. So it must be it must be a thing between, you know, for, for authors to drink malt whiskey. <laughs> to be fair, Joe, I haven't, I haven't been to quite a few festivals now. We're really not that fussy. <laughs> this, I mean, this is probably this is probably just it's more to make me look classy you know i'll, I'll drink anything <laughs> i like the style and what about um what about you mick what would you be taking with you well again i was this is a really tough one isn't it um like rob i do like a like a nice single malt and i did think of taking some of my favorite whiskey but then i thought that's going to run out at some point so i'm always <laughs> going to miss it um and then i thought about a hammock because i thought we always need to lie down but there's one thing I can't do without with, and that's my pillar. I have one pillar that I love. It's just when I need to go to sleep, that's the one I'll have. So, yeah, sounds pretty crappy, but I will take care of my pillar. <laughs> and it reminds you of home as well, doesn't it? So, you know, does, so, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's a good one. So maybe you can get a bit of whiskey off Rob and then fall asleep on your, pe on your pillow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's the yeah. plan. So that's great. So... Really enjoyed listening to all your, um, you know, all your answers and what you'd take with you. And uh, you, I'm sure you've given us a lot, given lots of us ideas for new books and interesting to hear all your, all your different choices. I see uh, Leslie, unfortunately, has had to go, but I see we've still got Claire with us. Claire, is there anything you'd like to ask the boys? Present, actually. No, I've just enjoyed listening to them talking about their books, hoping making a list. <laughs> to add to my ever-growing um, might read more 
yeah, mountain, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. huge. Well, um, thanks for uh, being with us tonight, Claire. No worries, it's been yeah. fun. So, that. do you want to, uh, Rob, would you like to just remind everyone of where they can find your books? And also, can you tell us what, uh, I know you sort of said, you you know, you're writing something different, but will they, will any of them be released this year or is it just something the very early stages yet? So the, the new ones are still early stages. Um, I'm, I'm at an interesting kind of juncture at the minute because I, um, I parted ways with my agent last year because she's focused on children's books now. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm currently uh, chatting with, I've got four who are currently looking at a full manuscript at the minute. Um, so hopefully we'll, um, we'll, we'll conclude negotiations with one of them in the not too distant future. Um, so the, the ones that I am working on haven't actually been submitted to any publishers yet. Um, if that doesn't progress, as, as I hope it will, then um, I'm more than happy just to, to keep speaking with Alison and Busby, current publishers direct. We've, we've already agreed that we'll, um, I'll share what I've got with them. Sure. Um, so nothing else this year apart from um, End of the Line, and that's out um, obviously now in hardback and ebook. It'll be out in paperback and audio in June. Right. Um, and um, if anyone's interested in, in a bit more um, of my rambling, I'm going to be on a, doing a, an event with South Shields Library that will be online in february so there'll be some some details on them um, on my facebook page and on my website um and i'm also uh we do some regular events with a, there's a group called the northern crime syndicate yep. which is myself and um and a group of other northern northern based authors i say northern it's it's northeast and northwest mm -hmm. um and we do a mixture of panels and we also do a, a thing called whose crime is it anyway where we kind of we ad lib mm -hmm. a crime novel with the help of the audience in in an hour mm -hmm. to try and create a one hour bestseller so um, if you fancy something a little bit different, keep an eye out on, yep. on Twitter and Facebook and um, and follow me on either of them and, and you'll see the details you can join in. It's, it's all just all on Zoom, just like this. Yeah, great. And just remind people of where they can, where they can get your books, your current books, and a little bit about your website. Uh, yeah, you can get it from Waterstones. You can get any of them from Amazon, um, uh, from, like I say, from Hive for your independent books, bookstores as well. Um, website is robertscrag.com. So there's, there's links for all of the books on there also. Um, you can also sign up on the website for my mailing list as well, um, which will get you a, a kind of up-to-date news about future books um, and also the occasional little um, sneaky extra with some short stories okay. and, and, and extra um, content as well with, with some give, giveaways as well. That's great. And Mick, can you just tell her, I know you mentioned at the start, you're sort of writing something. Do you want to tell, I don't suppose you've got an author page yet because it's the first one you've written, but do you want to just tell us a little bit, uh, just say again a little bit about the book that you're currently writing? Sure, yeah. So it's a, a police procedural based up in Newcastle. Um, and there is a victim of uh, a serial murder rapist um, she survives the murder, but the police managed to catch the guy by a, a DNA sample quite early on. Um, however, Rachel, the victim, still is getting threats and things happening to her, and the attacks are getting more severe. And the police are starting to wonder if they've got the wrong person, or was this person part of a bigger gang or a group of people? And I hope to have something finished and wrapped up by the end of April. Great. Wonderful. So we look Thank forward you. to uh, to he hearing more about that one. So thanks, thanks very much for everyone for attending tonight. Just to let you know what's going on in the next few weeks. Uh, next week on the 4th of February, which is, I think, the Thursday, we've got Chris Berry. Uh, the following Thursday, the 11th, we've got Leslie Cryer. And the 18th of February, we've got Diane Saxon. And on the 25th of February, we've got Graham Smith, who writes on the name of John Ryder. So plenty of uh, events coming up. This will be posted on our bookend. Information will be posted on our bookend book club. And the video from tonight will also get shared on YouTube and all their own usual places on Facebook. So thank you very much all for attending. And we'll see you all again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye Thank now. You. Cheers. Bye.